This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic us, Society. Uh, Roger Burdett is an ANS associate member uh, and is focused on numismatic endeavors, on uh, original research into the American experience. Uh, he is the author of more than a dozen critically acclaimed books, including six Book of the Year awards, plus over 100 articles uh, and contributor uh, to many standard references. Uh, his work is known for thorough fact-based research in uh, which conclusions are best told by contemporary participants. Roger has served on the U.S. Mint's Commemorative Coinage Advisory Committee, uh, providing, uh, or he's provided consulting service to the Treasury Department uh, and has advised many uh, American numism numismatics best known uh, authors, uh, companies, and individual collectors. Today, Roger will give a uh, will uh, demonstrate how the famous Soho Mint in England uh, wanted to wanted a hand in the production of early United States coins in his production and in this presentation proposals for Matthew Bolton's American coinage. So please uh, help us welcome Roger Burdett. Thank you. I would like to uh, express my appreciation to the. This morning's speakers uh, enjoyed every one of their presentations. And um, I had a couple of a quick thought related to them. I noticed that um, particularly taken by Eric Goldstein's uh, Massachusetts uh, fingernail clipper that he demonstrated. Um, and I was wondering if it might be usable um, for Chris to strike off some um, atheist proclamation medals that could be designed by um, Tom uh, Morris. So uh, that's something to contemplate for some future use, maybe. Um, I think some atheist proclamations are probably useful. And the fingernail clipper could easily be adapted to toenails, too, I think. Okay, and there's a... a Smiling an -er. Um, I think we're ready for you to share the screen. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do first is give you a short uh, introduction and then get right to the slides. Um, a lot of books and articles um, about early U.S. Mint refer to proposals to make coins for the new nation by a Matthew Bolton, but a few provide details. The, uh, this article examines uh, proposals solicited by Charles Borrell and John H. Mitchell, both of South Carolina, for state coinage, which they wanted produced by Bolton. A third larger scale plan was promoted by Mitchell once the country was organized under the new federal constitution ratified in 1789. A fourth but less distinct proposal came directly from Bolton. It involved coins and or machinery for the U.S. Mint after 1792 and eventually led to the Philadelphia Mint buying ready-made copper planchets for cent and half cent pieces beginning in 1797. Um, with final political and territorial independence of the United States under the Treaty of Paris of 1783, the new nation faced practical, practical realities of daily existence. Politicians struggled to devise a system of government based on enlightenment ideals, individual rights, and collective responsibilities. Merchants and traders operated in an economy that differed from the British model. The country was entirely dependent on paper currencies, foreign gold and silver, and imported lightweight coppers made by British speculators. Um, there was a demanding need for stable current money within each of the 13 states and compelling economic necessity for a unified stable metallic currency to further unite and stabilize domestic trade. From these requirements, the Continental Congress tinkered with the centralized national mint, but produced no working manufacturing. Under pressure of high post-war debt, entrepreneurs in one state, South Carolina, 
saw opportunity for economic improvement and personal profit. In 1785, the state legislature approved laws to protect indebted plantation and other landowners from forced sale at depreciated values and simultaneously created a type of interest bearing land bank paper currency. A Charleston, South Carolina resident then convinced the legislature to approve a plan for him to produce copper and silver small change to then exchange for paper notes. The coins were to be struck in Birmingham, Great Britain by Matthew Bolton, partner of James Watts in steam engine manufacturing. When the plan faltered, a second entrepreneur stepped in with a somewhat less ambitious proposal to supply coins from the same source. But time was not on his side. With approval from the federal constitution and its prohibition on individual state coinage, the South Carolina coinage idea fell, shifted to a larger United States version, including copper, silver, and gold coins. As before, Bolton was to manufacture the coins in his Soho manufactory. American expressions of independence, though through national coinage and political events, combined with the nation's general paucity of iron manufacturers and lack of experienced machinists to frustrate further attempts to import foreign made coins. The choice was made to have our own homemade coins at greater expense than to import coins or minting equipment from Britain. Matthew Bolton's Soho Mint was relegated to supplying ready to use copper planchets, a role that served well. Um, last little introductory remark here. Um, I want to emphasize that neither Burrell nor Mitchell, the two primary instigators of this, knew anything about making coins. They were traders in physical commodities, shipping rice, indigo, and other non-perishable agricultural products from South Carolina to London, where they were exchanged for manufactured goods to be sold back in Charleston. Much of their normal behavior was transmitted um, using letters of credits due typically at 180 days and 5% interest. Um, let's see. There we go. Okay, you've seen this part. Um, when Charleston was occupied uh, by the British in 1780. They left the city near the end of 1782. They took with them almost one quarter of the plantation slave labor force, which was critical to the state's economy. The plant, plantation owners faced disorganized field labor and ruined rice fields. Um, this is because most of the slaves that were in use there had come from slave from uh, rice producing territories in Africa and uh, knew how to grow the product. Most of the West Indies trade was lost and other foreign markets were closed to Carolinian merchants. Charleston and the Eastern plantation regions, once one of the richest cities in the colonies, faced an empty treasury, debased currency, scarce manufactured products and virtually extinct to credit. Crop failures in 1784 and 1785 further aggravated the situation with many members of the dominant planter class, class under a tremendous burden of debt. And here we have a little map of the Charleston. Um, conveniently, this same class of citizens also controlled the state legislature and they showed no hesitation in using the power of government to protect them from bankruptcy. At the height of economic problems in 1785, the General Assembly passed an act on October 12 that allowed a debtor to pay his creditors with land. As stated in the act's preamble, an account of on account of disappointments arising from the failure of crops and from the exportation of specie lately circulating within this state, which is the cause of the want of a sufficient circulating medium Many citizens of this state are threatened with total ruin by having their property seized for debt 
and sold for considerably below their real value. Um, to afford relief to such debtors without injuring their creditors, the value of land was to be determined by three appraisers and the creditor had to accept this valuation and could not sell the land for less than three fourths of the appraisal. This was nice on paper, but in practice, the appraisers were easily convinced to certify inflated land values, making what were useless pine barrows into high value timber. Rice fields, the backbone of local agriculture, were praised as worthless floodplain and disease infested swamp. Debtors, primarily the British traders and speculators, had few options and state courts consistently upheld local owners. The, this, was, this act was actually called the locally the Pine Baron Act because it was over, used to overvalue worthless land, which was then used to discharge debt. The, an outcropping of this was a paper money loan to which our first contract con, uh, coinage attempt was directly connected as a, it was a successful response to the hard times. Noting the scarcity of money in the state, the legislature directed the issuance of 100,000 pounds in paper bills. This paper currency, also approved October 12, bore interest at 7% interest and was placed in circulation beginning May 1, 1786 through individual loans of up to 250 pounds per person. The loans were secured by mortgage upon the land of the borrower or by gold or silver. The act essentially created one of the first land banks in the United States or the colonies. The bills were declared legal tender only in the payment of debts, duties, and taxes to the state, but any circulating medium was welcome and the money was widely accepted. More than 400 individuals Many of them politically influential planters received loans under the statute. Real coins, even low value coppers would have greatly enhanced public confidence. Here's one of the uh, notes. This is a uh, three pound bill, May 1, 1786. These uh, notes are uh, exceptionally rare. There's one in the ANS collection and this one is from a heritage auction. Um, proposed coins legislation was uh, Charles Burrell proposed coinage legislation to the General Assembly in 1785 and was passed on March 22, 1786. He would import copper pence and half pence and silver sixpence and shillings. $5,000 in half pence, 5,000 in pence, 5,000 in sixpence, and 15,000 in shillings to the British standard for the copper and the French standard for silver. He had 15 months to obtain the coins and he would receive South Carolina paper money of equal face value. Essentially, he was trading off the um, manufacture of copper pence for the paper money because he could make a lot of profit on that. Um, we think that Burrell contacted Bolton sometime in late 1785 or early 1786. The first surviving letter we have, which is August 19, 1786, already states a lot of basic terms that would have been agreed to in advance. You'll see them in the uh, blue type here. And um, it seemed that Burrell was ready to go ahead. His little uh, five ton proposal to start with would have yielded him a profit of about 300 pounds. It was only a 10th of the contract, <clears throat> but it was a way to begin and show the state that he could deliver. And remember Burrell didn't know anything about how to make coins and Bolton who did didn't know much about the American economy and very little at all about uh, South Carolina and how Burrell was gonna handle that end of things. Everything was ready as far as Burrell thought, but there was a misunderstanding between the two. Burrell assumed 
Bolton would be ready to coin copper as soon as the contract was signed, but Bolton would not do anything until the contract was signed and payment agreed. Thus, while Borel thought metal was on hand, coins designed, dyes prepared, none of this had begun. Bolton could not deliver anything until late in the year, with shipment probably in the, with the spring tides of 1787. Um, this meant that uh, Borel was pushing up against his deadline, and he was going to have difficulty explaining at home what was going on. <clears throat> at this point, it appears that Borel gave up. He sent a letter to Governor Moultrie of South Carolina in September, which was not received until December, where he essentially proposed to abandon the project. At the same time, the U.S. Congress passed an ordinance for, to establish a national mint on October 15, and Governor Moultrie passed Borrell's letters to the General Assembly where they were tabled. Uh, no action was taken, and the matter evaporated, at least as far as Charles Borrell was concerned. Our next uh, applicant for coiner to South Carolina was John Hinckley Mitchell. Mitchell, just like Burrell, was a commodity trader across the, the Atlantic and um, probably was a little more familiar with uh, the workings of the British system than Burrell was. Uh, Burrell spoke French as well as English and often wrote in French. Um, Hinckley was, wrote only in English and was a South Carolinian. <clears throat> now, the, th the thing he faced was that at this point, South Carolina had a, an actual cash using population of about 75, 76,000. These were people who would actually have the ability to use coppers or any other coin. So Mitchell changed things a little bit and proposed, proposed to the General Assembly that he would produce 20,000 pounds of halfpenny coppers. The legislation actually stipulates that they are called half pennies and not half pence. Deliveries were to be monthly in batches of 1,000 to 5,000 pounds, and he would receive state paper at 24 half pennies per shilling delivered. That was approximately, the coinage would produce approximately 127 half penny coins per user, which was a lot compared to what would normally be found. They would also be of full weight and intended to force the light copper fakes from circulation. Incidentally, most of the copper fakes evidently came from Birmingham or people associated with the Birmingham city area um, since there was a Bolton often complained of um, counterfeiters populating his town and trying to uh, lure away his workers. The federal constitution was the next step that happened that kind of got in the way. A conceptual is the design of um, Mitchell's halfpenny is here on the right with the arrow pointing to it. Um, it really consists of an excerpt from the state seal with the uh, palmetto tree in the middle and a number of other state symbols and the state motto around it. A uh, drawing of this seal without the mottos was uh, among some material located by um, Dick Dottis about 20 years ago, but um, it was not available when I had a researcher go to uh, Birmingham's library to look for it. So I've taken this out of his presentation from those years ago and combined it with a commonplace half penny type of reverse. The letters and a sample of the um, August uh, and October to governor, uh, to governor of the state were transferred to the state assembly. Uh, but again, no action was taken um, possibly because of the imminent discussions about the Constitution 
and South Carolina's eventual ratification on May 23rd, 1788, which of course prohibited state coinage. At this point, <clears throat> Mitchell, who already had a series of valid proposals and numbers and prices and everything else from Bolton, shifted to proposing a federal contract coinage for Bolton. And on all of these events so far, there was no direct contact uh, between legal authorities in the United States and Matthew Bolton. Uh, this was all a speculative venture by the two people claimed. Um, Mitchell <clears throat> showed up in um, New York claiming that uh, President Washington had encouraged him to uh, propose this plan, but we can't verify that the meeting ever took place. And it's quite likely that this was simply uh, something invented by Mitchell to bolster his opportunity. Mitchell claimed at the time that the United States, not mentioning who gave him these numbers, wanted 200,000 pounds equally divided in copper, silver, and gold. Um, this was coincidentally as much money as the Philadelphia Mint made in the five years between 1793 and 98. Bolton provided detailed prices for coinage and shipping, November 1789, and suggestions for design. He also said he would accept indigo, rice, corn, or tobacco, et cetera, in payment. Again, this goes back to Mitchell's um, commodity trading business rather to anything dealing with money. However, there was strong American support for National Mint, and this view might have eluded Mitchell given his location in South Carolina and his frequent visits to Britain. Mitchell also altered some of Bolton's proposal and had South Carolina representative Thomas Tucker place the plan plus some samples before Congress on April 7, 1790. Congress in turn gave the matter to Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson to report on the plan. When Jefferson made his report, which was just a few weeks later, he praised Bolton's samples, and he had already met Bolton in the uh, 80s and uh, witnessed his some of his materials or machinery in operation. And uh, he confirmed that the need for small coins was there, but rejected the proposal. proposal. He said it was not an exercise of U.S. sovereignty, a central point in the Treaty of Paris. Uh, the coinage could be captured in transit by an enemy. There was no way for the U.S. to prevent abuses in manufacturer since the manufacturing would be done in another country. And we would lose means of controlling our currency. <clears throat> Basically, the U.S. must establish a mint at home. Mitchell then came up with a hybrid proposal um, which was something that Bolton had apparently been mulling over for quite some time. He suggested that um, to Bolton that <clears throat> one of his coining, that one of Bolton's coining machines be installed in America to make the actual coins. And um, that way he felt that um, he could get all of the coinage business for the United States. Mitchell also did not realize that Jefferson at the same time was still trying to engage Swiss artist, die sinker and machinist Jean-Pierre Drops to build and operate an American mint and that Bolton and Jefferson were in direct competition for Drops services. Mitchell was also interested in a commodity business with Bolton which leaves the impression that coinage was not his prime concern, which it wasn't. A U.S. Bolton Mint, maybe. 
April 4th, Bolton remained, 1792, Bolton remained interested in U.S. coinage. He not only offered to equip the U.S. Mint with, its, with his steam-powered press and make whatever coins were needed prior to the facility operational, but he would train anyone sent to him to use to the use and assembly of the equipment. This would give the United States a state-of-the-art technological mint assembled and run by a factory trained person and a supply of coins to fill immediate needs. That is, Bolton would make an early batch of coppers, assumed to be coppers, send them to the US and at the same time send over a powered press. It's one of his steam presses. Um, what was not explained was how Bolton could export the minting equipment. A, uh, the Exportation Act passed in 1785 by British Parliament uh, prohibited the exportation of tools and utensils made of in the use of iron steel manufacturers and seducing people to go to some other country to move this. And it also included a list of prohibited items, including presses of all sorts in iron, steel, or other metal, cutting out presses, dyes used in stamps and presses, lathes, die sinking tools, rollers, slitters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, it covered basically anything that Bolton could supply other than struck coins and blanches. Bolton's last letter to Mitchell repeated that his presses could make better coin than anyone else, but he proposed no way to get them there. And meanwhile, Jefferson and others in the US government were searching for a true mint master. That is someone who could define an American mint, specify production processes, design and build equipment, create coin designs and engrave dies. Um, the coins would establish a national identity and drive out lightweight fakes. The person he wanted was Jean-Pierre Trotz. Um, and Trotz was probably one of maybe two or three entire people, people in Europe that could actually fulfill this role. Um, Both he and Bolton wanted this, the man, and Droz obviously took uh, what he felt was a better deal at Birmingham with uh, Bolton. Um, <clears throat> in November 16, 1792, Jefferson sent um, copper promissory notes and coins made by Bolton to uh, the president. And you'll notice phrase the superiority of which over anything we can do here will fully justify our wish to set our mint a going on that plan. I suspect this was a reference to the half dime striking by John Harper. And to me at least suggests that Jefferson was not very impressed with the first test, which I would expect to be the case because he had seen far superior work produced many years earlier by Matthew Bolton. Uh, when Jefferson, uh, Jefferson gave the task to US Minister Thomas Pinckney uh, to ask recommend, Bolton recommendations for talent, but the American Mint had nothing that would tempt Droz or any other true Mint master. The pay was only about $1,500 a year uh, although they could stretch that by combining the pay of two jobs into one, but it still wasn't very much. The equipment, what at least passed for equipment, was antiquated, um, finicky, all handmade, nothing made to match anything like the Bolton steam presses. There was an inexperienced staff, almost nobody except Henry Voigt knew anything about what they were doing with coin production. Production was erratic of what they were doing already and Congress was busy pestering everybody about what they were doing and where they were spending the money. 
The Philadelphia Mint wobbled along uh, for years and years. And wobbled is probably a good way of explaining how the uh, rolling mills and other things operated there, um, given the number of repairs that had to be made uh, almost on a monthly basis. Bolton continued to search for a resource for information. No talented person was interested, neither were artists or mechanics. The Exportation Act prevented selling a complete mint or its pieces to Americans. And locating sources of copper plate for coinage by the U.S. Mint began to dominate all of the, the, the discussions. The first two U.S. Mint directors were essentially placeholders. Um, the, regardless of the scientific credentials of David Rittenhouse. He again did not know anything about setting up a mint, about the tools and equipment that were needed, and he only had the faintest ideas on how to get the whole thing working. He kept things under control, he kept the books, he interfaced with Congress, but Henry Voigt was the only one who could actually put together the designs, the Thomas Voigt rather. Um, Tristan Dalton controlled the Mint's finances. In March 1795, Bolton renewed his equipment plus training offer through Minister Pinckney. And uh, in the same year, he also suggested that he could supply planches. When former uh, U.S. Representative Elias Budenov had a sincere interest in U.S. Mint and the coinage, and he was appointed Mint Director October 28. Bodenov concentrated on a consistent supply of copper, mostly sheep, which was the only means the Mint had of earning a profit. The need for copper and increasing demand for silver and gold coins led to ordering prepared cent and a half cent planchets from multiple suppliers in England. Um, this was necessitated because there was no really reliable source in the new United States, either for good copper metal in large quantities or for any company that could produce planchets. Um, the sheets that were used from which planchets were cut um, were uh, basically used by the Navy and cladding for ships and was fairly difficult to come by. Um, by 1798, after testing various suppliers from England, uh, Boudinot settled on Bolton as the primary supplier of Planchets until he was supplanted in 1834 by the Crocker Brothers from Staunton, Massachusetts. A little Soho meant in America never materialized. A requested proposal by the Mint Director in 1799 led to no serious negotiation. 1799 was also the year in which Bolton was finally given the authority to the ability to sell one of his uh, presses and minting equipment to another country. In this case, it was Russia. The U.S. unfortunately did not at that time have a deep talent pool or infrastructure to really support Bolton's steam press in any case. Uh, if you look at illustrations of Bolton's presses, um, they are not simple devices. An ordinary mechanic would have trouble doing much with them. You needed a pool of people who knew how to handle the machines and had experience working with that type of steam engine and that type of mechanical arrangement. The Philadelphia Mint also was expected to be temporary and moved to Washington City in 1800. That is, the Mint was never supposed to be permanent in Philadelphia. Its only claim to permanency was that it existed on, partially existed on purchased land which no other government office uh, used. The other government offices used rented space. For part of this reason, Congress limited investment into the Mint at Philadelphia 
another reasonable uh, assumption that this would be just sunk investment and that they were going to move to Washington. Um, that's kind of the end of the beginning, and I encourage you to read through the full, full article because that's where all the fiddly bits and the details about the financial terms and organizations of both uh, Borrell and Bolton and the later um, proposals are detailed. I didn't want to get into that today because this is um, an upper level view and something that I think uh, if I put in all the details, we would all be snoring by now. Um, before we go to questions, I especially want to recognize uh, four people, uh, Joel Arose for his suggestions on drafts of this article um, and his tolerance for reading through my uh, obscure prose. Charlotte Boucher, a, a historical researcher in England who uh, did the research for me in the Wolfson Center for Archival Research in the Library of Birmingham. Um, she found letters that had not been uncovered before and was able to provide me with the original French versions, uh, which were translated from 18th century French and including the idioms um, by Margot Tima Burdett. And I also want to recognize the late Richard Doughty for his groundbreaking research on this subject. It was his COCA article um, decades ago that I came across and that inspired me to look for ways to flesh out the general meaning of what all of these books and articles used to say about Matthew Bolton was uh, engaged to do something and nothing ever happened. Um, without Richard's uh, article, I don't think I would have had a good starting point here. It would have been much more difficult. So thank you. We have any questions from the audience or from the non-audience? Very coincidentally, I've also hired Charlotte uh, I have a high resolution image of the uh, proposed uh, South Carolina coinage. It's misfiled in the Birmingham library, uh, which is probably why you couldn't find it. And I expressed that I'd be glad to share it uh, with you uh, if, uh, since you don't have it. The, the reverse shows a, a woman on a beach uh, with a sunset. So a little different than what you showed. Were you able to find out what happened to Burrell because uh, I was unable to find out what happened to him after he left South Carolina. Um, I appreciate the uh, information on that. I will uh, gladly accept uh, images of it and um, uh, revise my proposals, my proposed design into something more uh, accurate. Uh, I can understand her not being able to find the thing. Charlotte was very careful about everything so i cannot uh recommend her more highly for what you want to do um <clears throat> the um just lost my train of thought what was the last part of your question burrell and what happened to oh, burrell um no he was in um i went through the legal files in south carolina and uh got copies of a number of things he and some business partners were under a lot of uh, pressure. They had multiple judgments against them through the Carolina, South Carolina courts. And they also had judgments in North Carolina against them. And um, I could not find anything that actually said what happened to him. The judgments were generally in the range of about up to 200 pounds. Um, but they don't say how they or when they were collected. Um, much the same for Mitchell, although his uh, relatives provided uh, a printed uh, issue of his correspondence with uh, Bolton. And that's noted on the uh, bibliography on the end of the slides. 
Um, I uh, went through a lot of things with South Carolina just to try to find, especially Burrell. And uh, the, they seems to have just vanished into the rice fields. I don't know. Any other questions? Yes, Greg Williams. Thank you. Yes, interesting presentation. I was curious, uh, the sample coins that were presented to Jefferson, do we know what they were? Uh, do they still exist? They were mentioned, the coins were mentioned, uh, are mentioned in the uh, full article. I just didn't include the details in the slides and uh, I don't have the article open in front of me at the moment. But if you look in the article, you'll see that uh, they're explained as well as a lot of the other material that uh, around the details of things. Whether they still exist or not, I can't verify. I uh, looked for them in some available sources, but um, did not find a reference to them as having come from Jefferson uh, or through Was or to Washington and then from him to anyone else. So maybe somebody can locate that information. Thank you. And the article that um, uh, Roger keeps referring to is his own COAC article for this COAC that hasn't yet been published yet. So you can't quite reference it at this point, but in due time. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Uh, we have a few minutes left for Roger. Uh, is there, a, are there any online questions or anything like that? Um, final remarks, concerns? Can I, can I ask about Borel's uh, calculations? Because uh, Doty in, in the America chapter in his big book on the Soho Mint says that the uh, um, that the that South Carolina was going to pay him in the state's paper value for value, and Doty just says it's hard to see what advantage would accrue. But you you said he stood to to make quite a bit of money with a. Would the paper be interest bearing and he was sort of taking a chance that South Carolina would be able to pay off or what's your what's your sense of what his what okay. his calculations were? Morrell's costs were based on the cost of copper and striking the coins. The vast face value on the coins was much higher than the actual cost. So he had a profit built in there, just like the US Mint in its early days made a profit on cents and half cents. It's the same um, seniorage that you would find on any other coinage. So that's where most of the profit came from. Burrell also could have collected the 7% interest on those notes because those were the land bank notes that um, paid interest and he was going to be paid in those. That was really a critical part of his deal was to both get the seniorage and the interest, which was above market rate at that time. So yeah, that's where the money was made. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Uh, Roger, I think unless there are any other uh, online questions, Okay, and um, if ANS would like to send copies of the full article to uh, participants in this meeting, it's fine with me. Um, they just have to recognize that it's not as pretty as the printed version. I mean, I have is that uh, I've done quite a bit of research on U.S. Mint's copper uh, purchasing of the 1830s into the 1850s, and um, I'm kind of picking up where you leave off. Uh, so I start with the Soho Mint and then really focus on the Crocker Brothers and company. Uh, so it's really interesting to see this, this, this previous generation of, uh, of what's happening specifically with copper production in the U.S. Mint and even before the U.S. Mint even existed and, and just you know, the, the, nego the failed negotiations that, that happened along the way. So, so thank you for setting that up for me. Okay, if, um, if you will send me a note I will send you uh, material that I've already written on the um, Crocker Brothers. That'll It's part of um, a chapter in a book I'm working on showing how the US coinage 
was actually distributed, hmm. including the commissions and other things. So it, it might be of interest to you. It might also be totally boring because it's repetitive. So I'll be glad to cooperate with that. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any other last questions?